uh, CNY Fertility. Hi, everybody. This is Dr. Magarelli, CNY Fertility in Colorado, um, bringing you another edition of Tuesday Night with Dr. Magarelli. Uh, we're going to be talking about insulin resistance, which, of course, is one of my favorite topics. Um, done a lot of research with insulin resistance, actually created the Institute for Sustained Health, focusing on the impact of insulin resistance on fertility, on aging, on metabolomics, on weight, on hormones. Uh, so I spent many years developing a program around how to help folks with insulin resistance get fertile, as well as to get fit. Uh, my, hey, Amber, <laughs> you always jump on nice and early. Good to see you, Amber. Welcome. Um, everyone say hi to me so I know you're on there live. Uh, looks like we've got about 30 people. Everybody say hi. Anyone who's on uh, Instagram, please jump over to uh, Facebook because we're going to be doing a nice, uh, actually probably 40 minutes. Um, this is actually a two to three hour uh, lecture, but I'm going to just kind of, it's going to be part one. We're going to call this part one. Hey, Tatita, good to see you. Gudinia, Claudine, welcome, welcome. Maritza, good to see you. Gabby, hello, hello, Gabby. Welcome, Rachel, uh, good to see you, thank you. Um, and again, all you folks on Instagram, jump over to uh, Facebook Live. Hey, Caitlin, Sage, Kirsting, Puffer. <laughs> yeah, just come grab me on Friday, just say hi, okay? Um, I will be definitely here Friday and Saturday. Um, and hi, Patty. Good to see you, Jen. Chrissy, good to see you. Um, today, we're going to be talking about uh, insulin resistance, which is another name for PCOS, which is another name for metabolic syndrome, which is another name for prediabetes, which is another name for middle age uh, weight gain, which is another name. So you're going to see that I'm going to try to tie this in a nice bow. And uh, hey, Jessica. Hi, Nisha. Hey, Chrissy. Good to see you, Jen. Good to see you, Patty. Thank you for joining us. Um, this is kind of a topic that's near and dear to my heart. And I'm going to show you some of my own uh, journey through this process um, with insulin resistance and the things that I've learned over, over time. Um, and my goal is really to give you a um, just the, like I said, part one. Hi, Ashley. Uh, part one of this this uh, understanding of of uh, how well, the role that insulin plays in the in especially with regards to reproductive medicine. Of course, my topic here is always how to create one healthy baby. As you may or may not know, I've done uh, I've created um, uh, uh, the Institute for Sustained Health. I've created the uh, bariatric uh, program in uh, in uh, Las Cruces. Um, I developed the Advanced PCOS Institute. I helped create the integrative medicine part of, um, of uh, traditional Chinese medicine in the, in, um, in the United States. Um, hello, Janet. Can't wait to finally go to the Colorado Springs location. Of course, we're looking forward to see you. Patty, Wilson, same, same. Uh, that's so great that you guys are excited as we are. And we are, by the way, I want to just give you some uh, work updates. Uh, we've hired an additional um, one, two, three, four nurses. Uh, we've hired an additional uh, two uh, medical assistants. We've hired an additional uh, two front desk people. We are now getting over 3,000 phone calls a day, and I just found out today that we're getting 100,000 requests for care per month uh, through our website. Um, yes, Jessica, app, uh, let's talk. We will be talking about uh, insulin resistance and gestational diabetes. They are related, uh, and they're really related around the idea uh, of, uh, of the role insulin plays. I'm just kind of stalling here for another four or five minutes before I get started. And as I said to the folks when they were on here at the beginning, is that this is really part one of probably a five part series on how insulin and food and nutrition play a role in reproductive medicine. Uh, yes, Maritza, we are growing and um, some really good news coming out of Sarasota, Florida. We're gonna hear about that soon. Really good news coming out of Atlanta. You're going to hear about that soon. 
some even news coming out about Philadelphia, maybe even soon. Um, um, and we may be seeing something in California. So um, we're trying to spread the word that high quality fertility care does not have to cost an arm and a leg, as you very well know. Um, okay, so uh, I'm going to get myself set up here. You guys sit back and relax. I'll be mostly talking for at least uh, 30 or 40 minutes and then just uh, write down your questions and then I'll get to as many as I can. Um, I love this subject. Um, I live this subject. It's the basis for Kiltz's Keto. It's the basis for um, many, many uh, nutritional, the, the whole uh, low carb, high fat approach to eating. Um, so here we go. So what is insulin resistance? I want to give you some other names for insulin resistance. Some people talk about metabolic syndrome. Other people talk about polycystic ovarian uh, uh, sy syndrome. Hey, Nefertiti. Um, other people talk about hyperinsulinemia. Some people talk about prediabetes. Some people talk about that middle age spread that happens in our late 30s, early 40s. Some people talk about it uh, in perimenopause. Some people call it underactive thyroid. Some people associate it with the obesity epidemic, the cardiovascular disease epidemic, the diabetes epidemic. And guess what? The center focus of all of these issues are related to how you metabolize sugars. And how you metabolize sugars is directly related to how much insulin uh, you will produce and how much insulin you produce is, is directly related to whether or not you have insulin resistance or hyperinsulinemia. So I'm gonna use PCOS because it's easy uh, and, and talk about that. Everyone thinks of polycystic ovarian syndrome as an ovarian, that's the ovary. Well, in reality, the root cause for uh, uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome, which means the behaviors that we see. It's not called polycystic ovarian disease. It's called polycystic ovarian syndrome is really based around hyperinsulinemia and insulin resistance. So let's start somewhere. So you could say you could start at the ovary, but I think we should start at, 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 our, at our key source of this dysfunctional insulin secretion, which is excess carbohydrate ingestion. So excess hypercarbohydrate -car injection, you can start here, causes a flux of insulin because every time you eat a carbohydrate, your insulin is squeezed out of your pancreas. At the, the, the most efficient way to squeeze that pancreas is with carbohydrates, less efficient is with protein and almost zero effect on insulin is fat consumption. So if you have the typical American diet, it's called the standard American diet or SAD, that's what it stands for, standard American diet, you, you can, and I'll show you the history of it, you'll have what's called hyperinsulinemia, meaning too much insulin will be secreted. Now we'll talk about the pathophysiology of how that affects cells, but let's say that happens. Well, what insulin loves to do, loves to do is to convert all that glucose that you're eating into fat. Absolutely. If you ask insulin what its number one job is, it's to take glucose and make fat. It would be happy day and night and night doing that. Well, that excess fat has its own properties, chemical properties, which causes aromatization. What is aromatization? That forces, that forces, um, it takes testosterone and uh, it makes estrogen. So adipose tissue takes testosterone, makes estrogen. We'll get to where the testosterone comes from shortly. So this excess estrogen tells the brain, hey, I don't need you to grow any follicles. I don't need you to get this person pregnant. I don't need any periods. I don't need any of that because I've got all this estrogen and the only place I can think of, this is the brain talking, that I can get estrogen is from an ovary that's developing follicles. It didn't realize that this estrogen is not coming from the ovary. It's actually coming from the fat tissue that we carry, male and female. And it tricks the brain into lowering follicle-stimulating secretion. 
So no follicle stimulating hormone secretion. So now the thing that creates follicles, which will allow it to ovulate and give you periods and get you pregnant, it's saying don't need any of that. And then unfortunately, what it does, the excess estrogen is say to the brain, well, we need, since you had all this lovely estrogen and you want to get pregnant, that's what it's thinking is happening. Let's produce progesterone for progestation, the second half of your menstrual cycle. And so it secretes luteinizing hormone, which tells the ovary to not develop a follicle and, and ovulate. No, it says make more testosterone. So, it, and that's what LH does. It, in the ovary, it makes testosterone, which is then converted in the ovary to estrogen. But in this case, that excess androgen or testosterone leads to two things, chronic anovulation. So these women, they call them PCOS. Um, these women uh, will not ovulate, therefore not get pregnant. These women, or by the way, it's it can happen whether you're trying to get pregnant or not, will have excess male hormones. So they tend to get extra hair on their face, on their chest, excess hair on their bellies, they get acne, then they start getting this male pattern baldness, which I'm really good at doing here. And then you lead, and that in turn is going to lead to hyperinsulinemia, insulin resistance. So this whole pathophysiology of PCOS is not really ovarian syndrome, it's hyperinsulinemia syndrome, affecting the ovary, and you'll see later the testicles, affecting the adipose tissue, affecting the hair growth, affecting the brain function. It is not rocket science why this is all happening. So as I said, I'd mentioned about males, in a typical male, there's a, a interplay between the FSH and LH secreted in the brain of the male and through insulin and leptin affects testosterone production in the testicles. So in a normal balanced system, you got adequate testosterone. Now, what if the man too has the standard sad American diet, excess uh, adipose tissue? Well, what happens is that excess adipose tissue is now converted into estrogen. The worst thing for any guy is to give them estrogen if you want them to be fertile. This reduces libido, it reduces, it increases impotence, it reduces uh, testosterone, and therefore uh, sperm production. And this excess estrogen, unfortunately, is interpreted in the brain to mean, well, I don't need any testosterone. So these men find that their testosterone was at this level is now going down and down and down. Secondarily, when they develop these adipose pockets in their body, they tend to get it around the, the belly and the mid part of the pelvis. Well, that unfortunately keeps the testicles heated. And that in turn causes um, this hyperthermia, causes a reduction in the motility of the sperm, in the count of the sperm, and in the quantity of the ejaculation and in the ability for an erection. So you're seeing this same situation of insulin resistance, right? This is all associated with insulin resistance and insulin resistance is all associated with what we put in our mouths. So this has to be something that a reproductive endocrinologist has to be really thinking about. So what I did is I put together some of the studies that looked at insulin resistance and IVF. But what they found in the early 2000s, and I'll explain why the time is important, was that nah, there's nothing, there's no correlation. But, but as four more years, the same author looked at the data again and went, whoa, wait a second. Insulin resistance correlates with impaired response to your medications and lower live birth rates. So has a direct result on this. Another, another group said, yes, there's an effect. We're not 100% sure. Another group said, yes, there's an effect, but with interventions, you can modulate it. Yes, uh, this another group said, yes, insulin resistance affects your IVF income uh, uh, outcomes. And Wang looked at this and he said, well, wait a second, there may be an obesity component to it, which is just insulin resistant going crazy. You know, I don't get hung up on words like obesity and excess weight. It, that's not, unfortunately, they're, they're now pejoratives or bad words, but it doesn't matter to me. It just tells me this person is suffering with insulin resistance at an extreme. And the, the question, the first question here was, does insulin resistance and gestational diabetes and preeclampsia correlate? Absolutely. 
Absolutely. It does correlate with gestational diabetes and also subsequent diabetes. So it's insulin resistance. Does insulin resistance affect FSH stimulation in clomid resistant patients? Yes. These patients re, uh, get more canceled IUIs, get more canceled IVF. And again, it's all associated with this inability to modulate the amount of insulin. And it's not an inability to do it, it's an inability of knowing how to do it. And like I said, this is a four or five part series. And so we're gonna get to real details on how to lower your insulin resistance. Today, we're really just gonna introduce the topic and then I'm gonna try to leave some time at the end for questions. What about insulin resistance and miscarriages? Absolutely, the highest risk of miscarriages are in those patients who have insulin resistance. This is not the protocol. This is not the institution. This is not an, a certain needle. This is not ICSI. This is not hatching. This is not a low dose protocol. This is not going to laugh. This is not growth hormone. This is simply the physiology of the, the patient and how it's impacting their fertility, regardless of the help we're trying to give, even with high tech. Does, does this result of insulin resistance, which is obesity, in, uh, uh, impact reproduction? Yes, especially in patients with PCOS. Huge article, review article, showing article after article after article saying that if you associate PCOS, because there are thin PCOS and there are not so thin PCOS, um, you can see that there's a direct correlation to fertility outcomes. Now in men, does insulin resistance impact how much testosterone they're secreted? The answer is absolutely yes. Does insulin resistance impact how many newborns are in the neonatal intensive care unit? Absolutely yes. Um, and higher unfortunate mortality in those children. So yes and yes. And then does early exposure to insulin resistance uh, uh, from the mom, this is uh, transgenerational, affect the baby's weight gain? Absolutely. Now I put down here that, because this was I, was, I was looking at this a long time ago, but in cows, for example, insulin resistance impacts egg quality. Well, we now know that there are some studies looking at insulin resistance and how it affects human egg quality. So this is, this is critical to understand that this word PCOS, this word metabolic syndrome, this word insulin resistance, this word middle-aged weight gain, this word pre-diabetes, it doesn't matter. The title, the function is exactly the same. So I was diagnosed with PCOS and then years later I was told I have insulin resistance but not PCOS due to lower AMH. Baloney, Lindsay, baloney. The AMH is not anything. It's just a marker of activity of follicles. It tells you nothing about your metabolism. If you have PCOS, you have insulin resistance. If you're above 35, you have insulin resistance. If you're 10 pounds overweight, you have insulin resistance. If you, um, you know, the, the list goes on and on. So don't get caught up on what measures insulin resistance because it's very difficult to measure. Who cares what the name is? What you want to understand is what it is, how to mitigate it, and how to improve outcomes. So this is a book. It was put out by Harvard, and you know everybody looks to Harvard as the sine qua non of knowledge. I happen to not like this book very much. Um, I, I think that it's it's a, a very conservative view and a very uh, one-sided view uh, of the uh, of 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 what we understand about medicine, but there were some good points. And I'm a guy who takes good points from any anywhere. Anywhere I can get somebody to teach me something, then I'm gonna talk about it. So what can you do with you if you have insulin resistance? Well, what you can do is give metformin. Why? Because it lowers your blood glucose. So since glucose is the cause of excess insulin secretion, anything that could lower it would be a good thing, right? That makes sense. The problem is this is a chemical compound that does affect the liver. It's not, you know, it's, it's a tough medicine, but what else can reduce glucose in your bloodstream? <laughs> not eating it, not eating it. Kilsa's keto diet is high fat, high protein, extremely low carbs. It's a cute name, it's great. 
um, low carb, moderate protein, high fat consumption reduces glucose in your bloodstream. No chemicals, nothing. Keeping your carbohydrate level uh, of consumption down to 50 grams a day. It might be that simple, and you'll see all of the benefits of metformin like that. And then the second one, of course, reduce ingestion of glucose, which I just said. Um, and he notes that insulin resistance is a function of PCOS. Stop, and we'll see this reason, high fructose corn syrup, high fructose corn syrup. Avoid it like the plague. And I'm going to show you some data on that. The other part of this, and I'm just talking about um, insulin resistance, but remember I said that insulin resistance is a result of hypersecretion of insulin. Well, um, hypersecretion of insulin is caused by glucose, and this hypersecretion of insulin uh, causes the cells to reject insulin's function, which is to provide energy or to build fat. So the only cells that don't have insulin resistance are fat cells. So your brain, muscle, bones, eyeballs, nails, gonads, all can be taught not to use the energy of glucose because it's damaging at too high a concentration. And so that extra glucose that doesn't go into muscle energy or doesn't go into growth or, or uh, movement is now converted into making fat, okay? So that was their idea that there, you know, there may be some functions there. And then they said the, um, they've really felt that if we looked at a low glycemic, low carb diet, high monounsaturated fats, which are things like avocados, um, uh, butter, um, you know, coconut oil, uh, and high protein, that has a little controversy. It doesn't have to be high. It just has to be approximately a gram per kilogram lean body mass. These are the things that they found not only affected the insulin uh, function of the cell, it improved menstrual regularity. And later on, on one of these days, I'll tell you about the research that I did at the Institute for Sustained Health. Uh, and then also the key thing is that the brain functions poorly when we have hyperinsulinemia and it leads to issues related to depression and self-esteem. And if you compound that with issues related to depression and self-esteem with fertility, and you compound that with issues related to libido, and you compound that with issues related to, you know, creating a family, you can see that this insulin resistance kind of describes a lot of the patients that we see when they come in to see us. They're, you know, they're stressed, they're depressed, there's, and a lot of times they just blame it on the fertility, but it may well be an, a really a, a response to hyperinsulinemia. He went on to say things like avoiding trans fats. That's, of course, that's, a, that's basic. Things like olive oil are great. Um, uh, uh, vegetable proteins, um, not so sure that's exactly the right way I'd go. Slow carbs, I'm thinking more and more, that what are they, beans? Maybe, maybe okay, but again, as long as you're keeping your carbohydrate consumption low, he's saying pick the right carbohydrates to eat to keep your carbohydrate consumption low. Take multivitamins, folic acid, iron, et cetera, and have an exercise plan. They also talk about movement. I'm not gonna be talking about exercise in, in this, these lectures. Um, exercise's role, I can give you the short form, is to maintain body weight. It is not a weight loss uh, uh, in patients with insulin resistance. So basically it says insulin is the key to for the impact of fertility by the diet. That's it. It basically says that's it. In other words, we know that dysfunction of insulin due to excess carbohydrate consumptions will lead to infertility, bottom line. Now, why is this personal? Well, there's pictures of me a little, a few years ago, um, the guy on the right thought he was just fine. Guy on the left uh, was after learning that I have insulin resistance. So it was a very personal journey for me, and that's what helped me create the Institute for Sustained Health. And in the Institute for Sustained Health, we looked at aging, PCOS, metabolics, hormone, obesity, anything related. To, and then, of course, sitting in the middle of this, this was attached to my fertility clinic. 
So I would send patients to the Institute for Sustained Health for understanding how foods were influencing their PCOS and, and their fertility. And a lot of times, believe it or not, they never came back to the fertility clinic because they started ovulating, they started menstruating, they started, and they got pregnant. As a matter of fact, 24% of folks I sent to my institute just to look at the nutritional side of insulin resistance got pregnant on their own, which is lovely. That's the best way to get pregnant. Um, and so, so that's kind of the preamble. So how did we get here? And that's really what I'm gonna do for the next 15 minutes is, how did we get to this issue of the insulin resistance epidemic that we see? So let's look back. So here's a, a nice little cartoon. I love this cartoon. It kind of says for 2 million years, we've evolved to this stage of the human uh, form, but in 10,000 years, which is not the threats as a blink, we've evolved to this human form. What in God's name happened 10,000 years ago? What happened? So guess what happened? Agriculture. Prior to 10,000 years ago, there was no agriculture. So that means there were no, there were no farms, there were no grains, there were no, uh, well, certainly no packaged foods, but there were none of this uh, institutionalized eating. So that's okay. So that happened about 10,000 years ago, but the real issue which has happened to the United States and then the world was an event in 1977. In 1977, Senator McCarthy, who was in charge of the Senate Select Committee on Nutrition and Human Needs, looked around and found that America had grown from the four, 1940s, which was about five or 6% obesity in the United States, to a whopping 8% in the 19, up to in 1970s. And what they realized is that 4% increase in obesity in the United States was leading to an enormous increase in diabetes and cardiovascular disease. And this is the first time a country has decided to ignore its history and decide for its people how to eat. Now you remember America is a melting pot. So to do that means people from Asia, Africa, Europe, they were gonna come up with a standard way we were gonna eat. And they said, okay, we're gonna study this, we're gonna study this. Now the problem was the, the, the institutes that were like Harvard, Yale, Princeton, which had these great nutrition departments, which had these guys who write papers, were all the advisors. Well, they were also the advisors to General Mills post, um, uh, the grain companies, um, Kellogg's, it was the same advisors. So when they went through this process, they said, well, let's see, uh, cardiovascular disease is fat in the arteries, people are getting fatter, so it must mean that fat is the reason why we're having this problem. And so if we reduce fat, great, well, what are you gonna put instead? Well, let's give them something that's very inexpensive, the United States is known as the breadbasket of the world. Let's just give them bread. Let them eat bread, as Marie Antoinette said. She actually said, let them eat cake. Same thing, let them eat flour producing products. And so the decision was, well, let's increase the carbohydrate <laughs> intake, decrease our fat intake, and decrease access to, to foods that have cholesterol, like farm fresh eggs and meat. Because they decided, regardless of the data, but that was the thing we needed to do. So what did we do as good Americans? So here you see fat consumption in the United States. Now, no one talked about the fact that you're worried about obesity in 1977, and you're saying it's because of fat, but if you look at our history, we have been reducing and reducing the amount of fat we were consuming, but that's what they decided. So Americans said, okay, we won't eat anymore. We had a little bit of a blip, and then we stopped eating. We did exactly what they expected for carbohydrates, 1977. We said, okay, carbs are good, fat is bad, so let's eat a whole bunch more carbs. So if you've ever tasted food without fat in it, it has no flavor because food gives fat a flavor. So they said, well, we have to get some product that we've been throwing away that the pigs won't eat 
that nobody will eat. We thought it was garbage. And let's see, well, it turns out that let's see if we can make something that's super, super sweet uh, so that people will eat. Well, they invented high fructose corn syrup. And what they realized, and so what you can see in 1977, all of a sudden, every single product had high fructose corn syrup. So now we're following the plan. This is all good, more lower fat, more carbs. You know, we should all be getting healthy. It was sure get you know, everything should be working fine. So like I said, we did this, we started eating more and more sugars and guess what? If you look at insulin resistance, diabetes and obesity, starting in 1977, that little blip that Senator McCarthy was worried about now began to accelerate, accelerate, accelerate. And, and this is the adult obesity. But again, I use insulin resistance. I use prediabetes. I use PC. I mean, a lot of different things I use. And you can see that the result of that decision was a dramatic increase in the amount of fat, which means the body was seeing more glucose, making more insulin. Insulin was then couldn't get into the cell. So then it decided, well, let's make more fat, which it did. Oops, I went the wrong way. Okay. Then we said, okay, what kind of foods are we doing and what's happening to it? So again, 1977, we, we saw this wonderful um, uh, increase in the amount of total carbohydrates. But what was interesting was we were not seeing an increase in the whole grains that we had done since, you know, we were a, a, a country. We were not seeing any increase in whole grain consumption, but this dramatic increase in glucose consumption. And of course, as you know, glucose consumption is associated with diabetes. So guess what? 1977, this is our glucose con carbohydrate consumption. And guess what? All of a sudden we're ticking up, ticking up with diabetes. Another way to look at this, pre-diabetes uh, is insulin resistance. That's what pre-diabetes is. So of course, to get diabetes, you have to go through pre-diabetes. So wh what did they do? So if you look back in the 1940s, they had these little ways of eating and you'd have yellow vegetables and green vegetables. You'd have lots of whole milk and butter and cheese, fish, you know, fatty fish and pork. You'd have a serving or two of bread and maybe a serving or two of vegetables, you know, so, and you had this, you know, butter consumption. And they, they felt that this was not the right model. So in, so in the 70s, they came up with this pretty model, which I'll show you here. So what they did in the 50s is we, they recommended about four or five servings of bread a day. And in the 90s, we've actually grown to six to 11 servings of carbohydrates in the form of breads and pastas, to two to four servings of fruit, which is pure sugar to three to five servings of vegetables, which is sugar plus fiber, very little uh, fatty uh, milk and uh, yogurt and cheese, smaller amounts of protein and almost no fats. So what happened? Well, what happened was that this impacted public, this public policy in fact impacted our health. And how did it do it? Well. Well, we did what we were asked to do. So you saw that in women, they kept their fat consumption low. And then in the 70s, they started increasing their carbohydrate consumption. But unfortunately, carbohydrate does, doesn't make you full. There's no satiety. You never feel full eating carbohydrates. You only feel full eating fat. So what did we do? We started increasing the amount of calories per day consumption. So there's about a 300 calorie increase per day. 300 calories over 10 days will add an additional pound. So every 10 days, we're adding an additional pound consistent with the one pound of weight gain. And if you look at it another way, this is food calorie consumption by type, you can see that we had a dramatic increase in the amount of carbohydrates, frappuccinos, you know, those things that uh, you get at Starbucks. Why do you think the Starbucks um, uh, counter is filled with carbohydrates because you get stimulated by the caffeine, you get um, you you get an insulin rush with the carbohydrates, but you don't get full, so you'll buy more. So you have an addiction with an addiction.
And as a, here's a description. We used to have a lot of fiber in our day, a diet in the 20s and 30s. Our fiber went down, never really increased. But look at this. This is slow carbs. Fiber is slow carbs. The fast carbs in the form of sugars went through the roof. Sugars cause insulin resistance by creating too much um, uh, insulin secretion, which tells the cells, you know, save me. And then Again, here's your free fructose, high fructose corn syrup, and it's a direct link from the 70s. You just you didn't see it as quickly, but this, this the changes in the percent of obesity, which is another form of insulin resistance, just went skyrocketing. I use it as a surrogate. And guess what we did? We exported this around the world. So everyone listened to us. Basically, fats were bad, carbs were good, now, the French were very resistant to it, so you can see they didn't have as much a dramatic, but certainly England, Canada, Spain, uh, even Switzerland, you can see these dramatic increase in diagnosed obesity, again, form of insulin resistance, to just simply being overweight, which of course, many more people are overweight versus obese. But again, that's another way of saying many more people are insulin resistant, which is another way of saying uh, we have more and more and more uh, infertility. Okay, well, it, rec it suggested that by 2020, this was a uh, studies done in the 1990s, they said by 2020, we would be 70% overweight and we actually have surpassed that. So this trajectory has not slowed, it's actually sped, sped up. What else happens when you're depressed and you're, you're, you're feeling not good about yourself? You don't move as much. So what you've seen concurrently with that is a dramatic dropping in physical activities in the major countries of the world, which in and of itself, it doesn't cause you to gain weight, but it, it doesn't stop you from gaining weight, which is what I said happens when you, when you, uh, when you uh, do exercise, it keeps you from gaining weight. So let's look at some numbers in the 1800s. Uh, let's just look at sugar consumption. Obesity was around 3%. That means three people out of um, every 100 were overweight. That's the way of looking at it. And they were somewhere between eight kilograms or uh, 16 pounds of uh, sugar a year, okay? Then if you look at in the 1950s, we got up to three times that much to 45 kilograms. Uh, and then again, by the year 2000, we're now up to 70 uh, kilograms, which is another 133% um, increase. But our in obesity, again, a form of insulin resistance, went up 200% between 1900 and 1950, which worried them. But between 1950 and now, you see it's gone up almost 400%. Again, essentially, because we focused, we listened. We were told that carbs were good and, and fats were bad in 1970. It's been proven over and over that's not true, but people don't change, it's hard. So how do we trick you? Well, the way we trick you is we name it all different things. We named sugars all different things on our ingredient list. I was looking at this high performance um, supplement for athletes because we've made the perfect mix. And guess what it was? It was dextrose glucose, salt, and that was their mix. So you might see crystalline fructose or maltodextrin. You might see malt syrup. You might see inverted sugars. You might see high fructose corn syrup. All of these have the same function, which it is to have super amounts of insulin secreted. And then by the way, even the fake um, uh, uh, sugars, which means they're the fake sweeteners, fake sweeteners trick your body into producing insulin anyway. So that's why now all the sugar-free soda data now says that there's a direct correlation with how much uh, diet soda you drink and how heavy you are. The more diet sodas you drink, the heavier you will become because all of these will cause insulin super secretion. Stevia is a little bit different, but anything sugary, sweet, will tell the brain secrete insulin. And it also keeps the addiction going. So what do we eat in our lifetimes now? Well, 
per, per day, about 12 teaspoons. Per week, about two cups of sugar. Uh, per month, about uh, almost eight cups. Per year, about 45 pounds. And a dumpster full of sugar by the time we're 60 or 65. But how much uh, high fructose corn syrup in addition to the uh, carbohydrates we're consuming is a, is a basic jacuzzi uh, full of that. So all of this is pointing to the fact that you don't have to be tested for insulin resistance. If you're 10 pounds overweight or your fat hangs over your belt, over your belt or you, you have irregular periods associated with excess hair, or the male has low testosterone levels and poor libido, or there are signs of infertility, reduced fertility, you don't need a diagnosis. You can do something about it. So let's see if, that, if uh, Senator McCarthy was right. He said, saturated fats are bad for you, and therefore, if we stop the saturated fats, we will be all cured, 1977. This is our meat consumption prior to 1977 in green. We said, we will listen to you. So we said, we'll stop eating it, stop eating it, stop eating it. But look what happened. That didn't result in lower obesity. If you just plot out obesity, again, another form of insulin resistance, you see this dramatic increase in obesity. So that didn't work. So what about grains? So prior to 1970, remember the people who made up this diet for Senator McCarthy were the people who sold or consulted with the grain companies, Kellogg, Post, and General Mills. Well, what was happening prior to 1970 was people were not consuming their products. So what did they say? Well, we think the more carbohydrate you eat, the lower the obesity rates, right? So again, here's your obesity rates. Here's your carbohydrate rates here, they're going down. Oh, now we said carbs are good. So now our carbohydrate consumption went up, went up, went up, went up, and guess what? Unlike the meat, which it went down, obesity went up, here it went up and obesity went up, insulin resistance. So this is what the United States in 1985 began to do, is they began to say, okay, Again, using obesity just as a way of measuring insulin resistance, let's look at who's, who's got more insulin resistance and they colored it. So if 10% of the community had it, you were darkish blue, or if you're 15%, you were really dark blue. And you can see there was nobody that was 20 or 25 or 30% uh, with insulin resistance or obesity. And that was 1985. Well, if you overlay 2018, they don't have that light blue anymore. They're gone. The light blue is gone. That doesn't even rate anymore. So they went to green as 20%, which was one of the worst here, right? 20% was considered the worst in 1985. Well, now Colorado is considered the best because we have about 20%. But now the rest of the country is not 25, 30, not 30, 35, but now we're looking at 35 greater than 35%. And this is projected to be almost completely red by 2030, the whole country. And in fact, they've now changed these categories to 40 to 45, 50 to 55, 60 to 65, 70 to 75, obesity. So these colors, and again, the only reason I'm saying this is we can relate that to our inability to manage our food correctly. So, what what the what does this all how how do we put this all together? So let's talk about the role of insulin, and then I'll get to some questions. Um, insulin is important uh, is is pathologic in the production of estrogen in men, which leads to li libido issues and poor testosterone and low sperm. It does the opposite in women. It creates more testosterone, which leads to anovulation, no ovulation, therefore a lower chance of pregnancy, hirsutism. It leads to this inflama inflammation, which we know is, the, know is the cause for just about everything in disease. It definitely gets you into that fatty liver syndrome, which is where they do your liver profile and they say your AST, AL tills are elevated. Insulin causes a fat accumulation, not only on the body on the outside, but on the inside of the vessels, clogging the vessels, which leads to hypertension. This clog, of course, is from the bad types of cholesterol because there's very much. It reduces neurotransmitters, which keep you from being depressed. And then it rusts you more, which has caused oxidative stress, which plays a role in all of fertility. 
So you can see that these diseases can all be traced back to hyperinsulinemia. So this at the center of the purpose of this discussion is to say that insulin is the center to various types of pathologies and biology in the body, all aspects of the brain, muscle, bones, eyeballs. Insulin plays a role. Insulin resistance can lead to sleep apnea, polycystic ovarian syndrome, blood clotting, cardiomyopathy, neurologic changes, increasing abdominal, intra-abdominal fat, which is the worst fat from a health standpoint, elevated blood sugars, prediabetes, hypertension because of the, um, uh, the uh, atherosclerosis, reductions in, the, um, in your good cholesterol, ele elevations of triglycerides. So a triglyceride is a sugar lipid. Hemoglobin A1C, which you guys get measured, is a sugar protein. So if your hemoglobin A1C is elevated and your triglycerides are elevated, that's another way. Um, that's another way of understanding how, how insulin can negatively affect you. And of course, can you recognize, I certainly recognized myself in this. Another way to recognize how, how if you have insulin resistance is look at some of the symptomatology. Are you constantly hungry? Do you have an inability to lose weight? Do you crave sugar? Do you have these aches and pains that migrate? Are you tired all the time? Do you have this upper abdominal obesity above the belt? If you look at that, so those are the symptoms. So what do you see as a result of it is this hormone imbalance. For women, of course, PCOX, S, and it also mimics low thyroid. For men, you get erectile dysfunction, loss of strength and stamina, ball mist, thinning hair, you get man boobs, um, you get fat accumulation around the waist. Guys wearing 29, size 29 pants and their waist size is 50. Well, they put the pants up to just their hips, but they can't get it around their waist, so they just put it down there and they think they're still wearing size 29 you know, waist. For your health, you see this increase in the bad cholesterol and triglycerides, which leads to more fat storage, which leads to more abdominal obesity. The imbalance in estrogen leads to low thyroid function, which leads to more. And of course, all of this, if we look at all of this, this is affecting your fertility. So a simpler diagram, and this is what you hear from people with insulin resistance, certainly for me. If you eat food, it makes insulin. That insulin, if it makes too much, the cells will resist it. That's called insulin resistance because too much sugar in the cell will cause it to die. Cells don't want to die, so they resist the function of the insulin. So if they resist the using the food or glucose, then the body uses the insulin that can be used to make fat because fat is not insulin resistance. Well, guess what? With no sugar going into energy, only going into fat creation, you feel hungry or hangry and tired. And so you eat food and you start this cycle again and you create insulin resistance. Okay, so I think I'll stop here. Um, that's a lot of stuff. Um, it's like I said, it's it's part one of, of what I want to talk to you. So um, wh how can we distill this? So low carb, moderate protein, high fat. So let me answer some questions. Kayla, Henry, 26-year-old PCOS did diary and gluten-free keto and lost 40 pounds. Great. BMI is 28. God bless you. But transfers didn't take this time. Still don't have periods on my own. What else can I do? Well, we have to look at the eggs, the sperm, the uterus, of course. It's not just weight. It's not just um, uh, the diet. It's a combination of things. There, you know, um, I don't know if you've uh, done an acupuncture. I don't know if you're taking zero vital. I don't know if you um, if there's a severe male factor. But don't focus on one thing, folks. This is a constellation of things. You can't say it's just this. You know what I mean? You just can't say it's one thing. Um, it, it, it's, it's a lot of things. And when you, what I would do is talk with your doc and say, Hey, what could, is there anything else I can do? Um, have I done surgery to see if I have endometriosis? Have I done an ERA? Kayla. Oh, same person. 
Uh, yes, serovital and acupuncture, good. Yeah, oh, there you go, ERA schedule for this month. There you go, Kayla, that's perfect. Absolutely perfect. So you're, you're saying, I wanna, I wanna make sure that I'm looking at everything. Most doctors take one, at one look at you and say, lose weight and you'll get pregnant. I hate that. Well, because that's not true, Yesenia, you're smarter than they are. It isn't, I'm, none of this says lose weight. I didn't say one time through this, you guys should lose weight or anyone should lose weight. What I said was reduce insulin resistance. I'm not saying diet. I'm saying change your consumption pattern to something that doesn't cause insulin secretion. High fat diet, moderate protein diet, low carb. Nothing says calories there. Eat what eat, eat. And, and that change of reducing the insulin will take care of the rest of the stuff. Um, don't, don't look at it as a weight loss thing. Uh, this is a health uh, rejuvenation thing. Uh, insulin resistance appears to be the key component. Uh, to, uh, yes, Maritza, absolutely. And you can directly, and when we haven't done it yet, but we can do a straight line function to low ovarian reserve, to poor reproductive outcomes, to the need for more fertility care, to super low sperm counts, to extraordinary low testosterone in men, to poor libido. I mean, all of these are leading to, um, to reductions in, in the efficiency of intercourse. Um, uh, because I haven't done acupuncture before, what are your acupuncture do, doing to you? Mine warms my stomach and puts needles on my limbs. Well, Christy, there's a protocol. It's called the CMAP protocol, Credenda Magarelli Acupuncture Protocol. Go to the www.aborm.org, the American Board of Oriental Reproductive Medicine. All of those guys know the CMAP protocol. It's not just simply warming bellies and putting stuff, stuff in the limbs. Go to the healing arts centers at CNY. I have PCOS and endometriosis and had, sh and had surgery twice and type 2 diabetic, but still have my period, but can't get pregnant. What else can I do? I've done. You're done. It's not keto. It's not supplements. It, it, you're, you're done. That's not the area where the problem is. We have to find out. That you're, you're welcome, Christy. You have to find out where is the problem. What is going on with the eggs, the sperm, the uterus? Do I have an, And you said you've had endometriosis surgery, PCOS. I don't know how old you are, Ty. Age, of course, is the number one reason for infertility. As we age, our fertility goes down. Sperm issues, the number two cause of infertility. As we get older, our sperm performance goes down. Uh, and then excess estrogen, <laughs> number three. You know, so there's a lot of things that can, can uh, contribute. Are you doing acupuncture? Are you doing the serial vital? Are you, you know, doing your, 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 you are doing the supplements? Fantastic. And you're 32. So there's something going on. And sometimes we have to look at the eggs, look at the embryos. I don't know if you've done IVF, but um, you may want to, you may need that for many reasons. Lindsay, I'm on metformin. I've seen lots of ladies in a support group on 2000. Is this something I should take my doctor, talk to my doctor about increasing? No. Tell your ladies in your support group, stop eating carbs and you may not need the metformin. That's what you tell your ladies in their support group because the purpose of metformin is to try to hide the, the carbs from the body. Well, why not not put them in there? Now, the therapeutic dose is somewhere between 1,500 and 2,000. But again, Lindsay, low carb, moderate protein, high fat, that's not calories, that's not dieting, that's simply a change in the types of food you're eating will do more for you. What can I do to lower my testosterone levels? Low carb, moderate protein, high fat, and, um, and, and uh, that will be the very best place. There are medications, dexamethasone, prednisone, to lower that. You can talk to your doctor about that. What are some in-depth tests to look at sperm besides a simple semen analysis? Well, there's the DNA fragmentation index, that's something that you can do, uh, uh, Y chromosome microdeletion, um, or you can simply do IVF with ICSI and get around some of that. If you lower insulin resistance, can you increase ovarian reserve, Derek? No, uh, ovarian reserve is genetic, but you can get access to the follicles that you have better. Uh, that's what you can do. In other words, it will allow you to use all your resources. 
And I think that's the key around acupuncture and a variety of other things is that that's, that's what we're hoping for. That's the thing that we're trying to, to impact is getting access to all of those wonderful follicles that are there. Other questions, and like I said, this is part one of a five part. I stopped here, but there's so much more uh, we can talk about around this, things we can do. I can give you some examples. Uh, certainly, the anything that's keto, uh, keto oriented is going to be a low carb, which is the whole trick of it. it I, you know, I love the names keto and all these other groovy paleo and all these names. But the bottom line, it's a lower insulin way of eating. Reduce insulin secretion eating. Doesn't have a ring to it, okay? R-I-E, R-I-E, -E, or something. It just doesn't have a ring. So people talk about keto and they talk about low carb, high fat, and that's to describe something. Keto is nothing more than a description of fat breakdown. When fat breaks down, it makes a ketone body. Big deal. Big deal, you know, low carb, high fat diet. It says what it is, eat less carbs, more fat. Now fats are things that are good fats, of course. What are the best supplements for egg improving egg quality in Nefertiti? Just review last week's um, lecture because that's, or two weeks ago, that's all I talked about was um, supplements. So that's all, you guys can go to fa uh, our CNY Facebook page and you can and look at my previous lectures. I'm building a library for you, okay? My cereal vital, is there a better time to take it? Yeah, uh, uh, take the cheapest one. I know they're coming out with all different ones. Get the least expensive one at Costco, 63 bucks for 40 days. Take it on an empty stomach first, first, uh, first time in the morning. I'm on the Kilsis Keto, eating one meal a day, eating meat in the evening. I feel well rested, using the, the restroom regularly. Uh, feel energetic and believe me, it will help my fertility. It will, Christy. You, you've got it. Not that it you, the way you're eating will help your fertility. Would you say exercise is one of the biggest ways to help insulin re resistance? In addition to diet, exercise will help with insulin resistance. Absolutely. Absolutely, fasting will help with insulin resistance. Um, yeah, listen to the whole video. Okay, uh, take a look at the family building guide. That's right, Jessica, a, it's good to see you back on. Um, yeah, so the family building guide talks a lot about the supplements, but um, what I did in my lecture is really cull that down to even simpler form. So take a look at the, the, the um, the, the video that I put together, the whole thing, as they said, because I think that'll give you a lot of information. I'm trying to simplify things, make it easier for you guys, bearing in mind costs, et cetera. So, you know, our goal is, um, oh, you've been here the whole time. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Jess. I know. I just am glad to see your name. I missed your name at the beginning of the talk. Kayla, I've been doing intermittent fasting and I've lost 12 pounds last month already. Love intermittent fasting. Intermittent fasting is simply not putting food in your body for at least 12 to 14 hours. That's it. That's simple. That's it. You know, I do it once or twice a week. Yvonne, I'm 44. I did two egg retrievals and got 22 mature eggs. Holy moly. Uh, do you know how many of will be embryos if I'm 44 years old with 22 mature eggs? No, I don't, Yvonne, because it has to do with um, your husband's sperm. Uh, that, so glad, glad you got eggs, but you have to see how the sperm work. Typically, um, I would say that, uh, let's use 20 because it's a round number. If you can get three or four good embryos, I would, I would be really pleased. I would be really pleased. Well, anyway, my hour has disappeared again. Um, I hope you guys... It keep enjoying these sort of somewhat uh, academic discussions, but I want, and again, you could always review and, and, and see the slides, go to my, go to, you know, go to our website, see the lecture if you want to get more information. I'm going to keep building this. I am writing a book so that I can talk about, um, uh, you know, the, it's sort of, um, it's uh, called fertile soil. You know, it's looking at um, metabolomics, metabolism, and how it plays a role in cellular dieting is another name. Um, we haven't decided um, um, 
what we're gonna you know what we're gonna call it, but it's gonna be about uh, the role of nutrition and and nutraceuticals. Um, thank you, Stephanie King, my dear acupuncturist from East Winds Acupuncture. I thank you. Stephanie is uh, uh, works with Dr. Diane Credenda at East Winds Acupuncture. Dr. Credenda created the Credenda Magarelli Acupuncture Protocol. Stephanie has joined us, amazing gal, uh, amazing acupuncturist. We're so proud and happy to have her on our team. Um, so, well, there you have it. Another wonderful week has gone by. Thank you so much, all of you. Um, thank you, Yvonne. Thank you all. Have a great week. Do some reading. Easiest thing to do is get an app called Chronometer, C-R-O-N-O-M-E-T-E-R, C-R-O-N-O-M-E-T-E-R. -E -E uh, I like that app for tracking your foods because it, it is certified that the information is correct. Other ones are out there, but that one's certified and I think it's still free. Uh, I use it all the time, it's fabulous. Um, and again, you know, it's not one thing, it's everything. So that means you can't do everything. Do the best you can. Trust yourself. There's no, the, the best success is trying. So, you know, don't beat yourselves up. You know, it's just the best, you know, um, the best way to, to climb the mountain is one step at a time, regardless of where you're headed. If you're headed in the direction of the mountain, that's what's going to get you there. So, you know, acupuncture, looking at the kinds of foods that cause insulin secretion, moving, um, kilts is keto, the supplements, all of these will help. Anyway, um, I don't know when my book is going to be out yet because I'm working diligently right now on it. It's probably not going to be out till 2022. It's going to be gigantic, and that's the problem is I can't stop writing it. Anyway, thank you all. Thank you for joining. Really appreciate it.